So my name is uh, Professor Robert Byrne. I'm a cardiologist. I work as a director of uh, cardiology at Matter Private Network in Dublin, Ireland, and I'm professor of cardiovascular research at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland University in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, my presentation today was on the 2023 ESC guidelines for the management of patients with acute coronary syndrome. I think uh, the first thing to realize about acute coronary syndrome is it's a very broad spectrum of uh, conditions and the uh, clinical presentation can vary from a very stable patient to a patient who's critically ill. In the past, there were separate guidelines for uh, advising on the management of patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction, and there were separate guidelines for uh, advising on the management of patients with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And it was felt that now it was time for the two to come together. There's lots of information out there, there's lots of studies, but try to synthesize everything in a single guideline on acute coronary syndrome. And I think this was an unmet need and hopefully we've delivered on this in our document, which is a large, a large document. It considered, for example, information from 936 uh, different uh, manuscripts uh, to give a, a large number of recommendations, which we hope will be helpful for the community. I think uh, the first thing is that the guidelines is a combined guidelines, as I've just uh, mentioned. Um, we try to outline a common pathway for the treatment of all patients with acute coronary syndromes, asking people to remember a couple of things, think straight away about an invasive management strategy, think straight away about what antithrombotic uh, treatment strategy uh, that you're going to use, think straight away about revascularization, and then finally think straight away already how you're going to prevent the next acute coronary syndrome by uh, focusing on secondary prevention. One of the changes, I suppose, uh, when we think up front about the invasive strategy is in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction, there isn't a major change. At first point of contact, you have to ask yourself, can this patient be treated uh, with primary angioplasty inside 120 minutes? And if yes, you do that. If the patient can't be treated within 120 minutes, in, in the opinion of, of you and your team, then you need to go with fibrinolysis first and then a, an invasive strategy after that. That hasn't changed much. In terms of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, also the basics of management remain the same. An invasive strategy uh, should be preferred. There are certain high-risk features. So we know if you've got an established diagnosis of uh, myocardial infarction, then uh, your invasive strategy should be fast-tracked. Previously, there was a class one recommendation, in fact, to do this within 24 hours. Now, some more data has become available and an updated meta-analysis, and we felt really a class 2A recommendation would be uh, preferable in this situation. So there's a slight downgrade in the, rec in the recommendation for invasive management and non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. In relation to uh, anticoagulant and antithrombotic therapy, uh, the recommendations of the 2017 guidelines on STEMI and the 2020 guidelines on non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome have been largely maintained. But this wasn't an easy decision because there were lots of new studies that came out in the meantime. For example, in relation to antiplatelet therapy, um, the default position remains uh, aspirin combined with a potent P2I12 inhibitor, which should be continued for 12 months. Now we realize that there are many studies out there which also examined a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy combined thereafter with P2I12 inhibitor monotherapy or aspirin monotherapy. And so they're represented in the guideline as an alternative uh, strategy. Um, and uh, I think this is clearly presented in the guideline. Well, we've seen uh, already uh, that in terms of the trials that are scheduled for presentation at the ESC meeting where the guidelines are being presented, already there will be uh, many trials being published which uh, might impact on the guidelines. And I think an important thing uh, to uh, note is that the European Society of Cardiology now has provision to do regular focused updates of the guidelines. So if there are new 
uh, information emerging at this meeting which is relevant for the guidelines, they can be considered rapidly with, if needed, a focused update in two years rather than having to wait four to five years for a further update. So there's going to be uh, information coming out on the management of patients with cardiogenic shock, there'll be more information on uh, antiplatelet therapy, there'll be more important studies on intravascular imaging which will be presented straight away at this meeting. I think uh, the dissemination of the uh, guidelines information is always something that we can look to do better. Uh, we want to reach as many people involved in the care of these patients as possible. We also plan uh, a guideline for patients and uh, that's being worked on at the moment. Uh, we've come up with a central animation or video of the guidelines which you'll find on the ESC website in order to try and reach as many stakeholders as possible in a 90 second summary. And I think uh, getting the information out there is the first part. Now, uh, there are a suite of quality indicators which are also in preparation and will be published soon. And that will help uh, those that are in positions of responsibility to look at a national level or an institutional level in how the guidelines are implemented. I think that will provide a useful uh, metric in order to measure uh, how good centres and how good countries are at implementing the guidelines because if you can't measure it then of course uh, you can't change it and uh, hopefully this will be an important contribution for the community.